Yeah, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Jeremy, and uh, today I'm going to talk about a project called Jupyter Lite. So it will be a mix of Jupyter, uh, WebAssembly, and uh, and Python. So um, first of all, uh, I'm currently uh, working at uh, Quantstack as a technical director, and at Quantstack we also uh, we do a lot of open source. Uh, so mostly on the Mamba ecosystem and uh, the Jupyter ecosystem, so I'm also a core developer uh, in Jupyter, so we help uh, maintain uh, projects like uh, Jupyter Lab, uh, Voila, uh, Dashboards, uh, Jupyter Server, Jupyter Widgets, a lot of Jupyter. <laughs> and um, yeah, and a couple of us are really active in, uh, in the Jupyter ecosystem, so if you are using tools in the Jupyter uh, world, you probably uh, be talking to us uh, on GitHub and things like this. So you might be wondering, how is uh, Jupyter Lite different compared to normal Jupyter? Because here I have a couple of cells, so I can just you know run them, and I get you know like what I would get in a normal uh, Jupyter notebook. But the thing is, um, Jupyter Lite is a little bit different. And to get an idea of this, uh, we can start from this repo. So this repo is the repo for the um, um, this talk, and if you scroll down, you see that at the very bottom there is a link that ends with github.io, and this is pretty much uh, the thing you have for um, when you host something on GitHub pages, which lets you host uh, static files on, uh, to make your website or anything else. So if you click on that, and you see that we get redirected to a, a JupyterLab uh, UI, and it boots in seconds. So this is one aspect of Jupyter Lite. You get, you know, very easy and quick access to your um, interactive uh, computing environment. Um, because in the end, actually, uh, Jupyter Lite is also published to PyPI as a Python package, and the Jupyter Lite CLI is pretty much just a static site generator. So, um, you know, like you would be using Jekyll for your blog or something similar. You can use Jupyter Lite to create your own Jupyter website. So, with this um, in place, it means that you can create your own in a couple of minutes. So, if you just go to this repo, uh, we made this uh, template, the demo repo. It's a public template on GitHub. Um, so, if you look at this uh, uh, screencast here, there is uh, normally this little um, use this template button um, here. And uh, just in a couple of minutes, you activate the GitHub pages and you have your own website. So that is very, very useful uh, if you want to have a very lightweight uh, Jupyter frontend uh, running in a browser. You don't need to set up any server. You don't need to open a terminal, run a command line, or anything like this. Um, you don't even need to install Python or any other packages locally, so skip all of this. And you can even add this little badge uh, that looks like this uh, yellow thing. So for example, uh, you have it on your readme here, and if you click, click on that, you can redirect your users uh, to your uh, Jupyter website. So um, since it's a static website, um, let's do this. It's uh, easy to deploy. Uh, we have a bit of documentation. So if you go to the docs on Jupyter Lite, uh, here we detail how you can host your own or used hosted environments uh, to deploy uh, your thing. So it could be on, uh, on GitHub pages, GitLab pages, uh, read the docs, uh, Versal, Netlify. Uh, many others, and um, actually the, um, uh, for the uh, main repo, that uh, the main JupyterLab repo, we use uh, Reader Docs. So if you go to the, this URL here, you're going to be using a website uh, based on the main branch um, and deploy to Reader Docs. So uh, before continuing, I just wanted to do a little bit of history just to highlight some of the um, prior art. Um, so in the past, there was a a project called Jive by Nick Bolveg, who is now a contributor of uh, Jupyter Lite, but also in Jupyter uh, in many, many places. And uh, he decided to get this work uh, with the same kind of motivation, trying to have like a static website. Um, but at the time, we didn't have um, the thing we were going to talk about later, uh, WebAssembly, Pyodide, and all of this. So it was, it was there, but it was more of an experiment. So then came uh, something that I wanted to experiment with. It's called the P5 Notebook. So it's based, the, the idea was to have something like a minimal notebook UI, um, but very focused for uh, P5.js, which, which is a, 
uh, JavaScript library to draw stuff on a canvas uh, that runs in a browser. So the idea was to use JupyterLab components and build something very, very simple and very, very minimal so that it could be used by people who want to uh, learn to code and things like this. Um, we also have another project called Baston uh, by uh, Romain Cassati, who is using the classic um, notebook, which is now um, deprecated, but um, it's also interesting because they, they managed to also deploy it uh, for educational purposes, so they have a, a couple of users there, so it's great to see Jupyter uh, used in edu education. And uh, also wanted to highlight uh, two other things. So, uh, one is starboard and the other is observable. Uh, those two are not strictly uh, Jupyter, but they are still interesting because uh, they use different approaches, so they can mix languages, for example, with starboard, and observable is more like um, browser native, so it's a bit more towards JavaScript, even though you can also run other languages if you want to. So these are out there, and they all have you know, the pros and cons, so it's still a, just to get a, an idea of where Jupyter Lite uh, fits in all of this. So if we go back to Jupyter Lite, uh, it's pretty much uh, a combination of Jupyter Lab and Jupyter Notebook when it comes to the user interfaces. So uh, you have uh, the Jupyter Notebook 7 uh, UI. So this is uh, pretty much what we see uh, right now. So Jupyter Notebook 7 is going to be the next uh, major version uh, for Jupyter Notebook and is going to be built uh, using Jupyter Lab components. And this is pretty much what you see here, so it just looks the same as Jupyter Notebook uh, 6, also called the classic notebook. And um, you also have um, Jupyter Lab, uh, so that's the one we, we looked at before. Uh, you can uh, work with files. Um, so if you go here, you can even you know, open plots, um, open, um, yeah, icons, um, you can also open um, GeoJSON if you want, um, also notebooks, uh, so that's the presentation I'm currently uh, showing here, and this is, um, yeah, so you can have like the notebook open and then you can uh, interact with them like this, like if you were using a um, normal, let's say normal Jupyter on your machine, and um, yeah, so the cool thing is that uh, we are able to reuse a lot, really a lot of things coming from the JupyterLab ecosystem. And uh, for example, the, uh, the themes. So here we have uh, a JupyLite night theme. Uh, that's a third party uh, theme that we can actually uh, use. And uh, these uh, settings are also persisted in your browser. So if you reload the page, uh, they, they stay. Um, so let's go back to light. Uh, what is, um, yeah, we have also, uh, there is also con consoles uh, in JupyterLab. So here we have the JavaScript kernel. So if you do uh, uh, something like this, then you get uh, some interactive computing with uh, JavaScript, but also with Python and other languages. Um, yeah, and also uh, you, um, you can change the languages. So. In JupyterLab, there is an uh, ongoing effort to uh, localize the interface, and uh, JupyterLite is just able to reuse this as is, so it's very, really re uh, great because all of the uh, work is happening upstream, and, um, and Lite is just able to reuse the same set of tools. So here we switch to, um, to French, and now it's in French. Uh, we go back to English. Yeah. And, um, this uh, localization effort is really like crowdsourced, so it's really great because it's also uh, translators helping uh, for all of the uh, languages. And um, maybe one more thing I can show is um, third-party extensions. So uh, let's say you have uh, a set of users and you want to introduce them to uh, the lab interface. Uh, so there is this extension by uh, Frédéric Cornoval who uh, wrote this. Uh, it's called uh, JupyterLab Tour and uh, you can give a tour of the interface. So it's pretty useful, especially with Lite, uh, because if you create your website and you want to guide your users, uh, you can use this kind of, of uh, extensions. And they are designed for JupyterLab, but they also work with Jupyter Lite, uh, which is great. Um, yeah. So let's stop, and let's go back here. So once again, uh, Jupyter Lite is really standing uh, on the shoulders of giants. So it's really built from the, the ground up, so it's just like an, another application. Um, 
but um, really mostly reusing JupyterLab components. So there is a lot of um, uh, work going on in a JupyterLab uh, ecosystem. So JupyterLab is just reusing as much as possible from that. And um, the, the kernels, they run in a browser, but they still communicate uh, to the front end using the, the Jupyter protocol. So it's still the same protocol under the hood, uh, which is great because it's all based on standards and it, um, it interacts really well with um, everything else. So here you have a kind of a picture of you know, IPython, um, libraries like BQplot, Matplotlib, and also uh, Python and so on. Um, so yeah, so we usually like to uh, refer to Jupyter as a WASM-powered uh, Jupyter running in a browser. And uh, WASM is the short for uh, WebAssembly. Um, and if you go to the Mozilla uh, Developer Network um, uh, documentation here, so WASM, WebAssembly is um, it's kind of a new thing, but it's been there for a couple of years. And uh, what it says is like it can run on the modern web browsers, uh, and it's also uh, near native performance um, and provides languages such as uh, C, C++, Rust, so that they can uh, target the web and uh, design to run alongside JavaScript, which is great uh, because JupyterLite is JavaScript, and we're going to see that uh, JupyterLite is actually uh, based also on um, a Python kernel uh, built on top of uh, Pyodide. So Pyodide is uh, Python, or actually C Python, uh, and the scientific stack compiled to WebAssembly. So Python is in C, and we saw that C is one of the languages that can compile to WebAssembly. So PyDive project um, does this, and um, JupyterLite adds an extra layer on top of this to be able to integrate that as a kernel uh, that can be used in, in the interface. So here I can run the code, and we see that uh, Python, it's a Python 3.9 um, because it's still using PyDi 0.19. Uh, 0.20 landed uh, yesterday, not updated yet, but it will be soon. Um, it's also using IPython, so IPython runs uh, in JupyterLite. So here, if you import something that doesn't exist, uh, you get some nice error. Uh, there is also basic support for code completion. Um, you can get some help, uh, like, like you would do in a normal notebook. Um, some magics are also supported, like the history. Um, and one thing that is nice also about Pyodide is that they provide a nice integration with the, the browser and with JavaScript, just like it said in the uh, uh, WebAssembly uh, uh, snippet above. So here we can actually use the fetch uh, method from the browser and use it to fetch data from somewhere else. And we combine that, combining that with um, uh, this kind of environments where we have, you know, viewers for JSON. This is really great because you can start exploring your uh, your request using this uh, JSON uh, viewer, and you can search for uh, fields and things like this. So, yeah, that's it. So, visualizations, um, Matplotlib is uh, shipped by default in Pyodide, so you can use it to do plots. Um, but since Plotly has a uh, JupyterLab extension, we can also use it in JupyterLite. So here you notice that you need to actually still install them a little bit on the fly like this. So that's um, one thing that is a bit different compared to uh, normal Jupyter. So if we do this, uh, we can then create a Plotly graph uh, that is interactive. Uh, there is also another library that is interesting, it's Alter. Uh, you can create these um, graphs and then you can save them to your um, machine. Um, GeoJSON, for example, is also another example. So uh, here we point to the BCC in Berlin. So that was for like more static graphs. Uh, now it's uh, let's talk about interactive uh, widgets. So iPad widgets also works. Uh, I can interact with them. Uh, if you link this one and we move the, um, the slider, it moves there too. Uh, and custom widgets also work. So here we have uh, BQplot. I can change the color, um, you know, change the graph, uh, create a new one, and then you can update the data and it updates automatically. So all of this is still again all in the browser and still again uh, reusing error, you know, the extensions as they are distributed. Um, another one that is interesting is iPyCanvas. 
So here we're going to create um, a game of life. So by Canvas is a library that lets you use the um, uh, browser Canvas from Python and uh, draw something on, uh, on that, so uh, using Python. So here we uh, draw uh, like the starting state of a, of a game of life. And um, actually, it's a good um, opportunity to also show you uh, another extension that is pretty neat. Uh, it's called uh, Sticky Land. And uh, here, you see if you click on that, you get this your sticky cell here. So you can uh, drag and drop it here. So hide the uh, input. And you can continue with this, and it stays. So it's quite useful. And again, it was made for JupyterLab, but it works also with JupyterLite. And then we uh, run that cell, and then you get your um, thing output updated. Um, and you can continue scrolling or do something else. OK, so let's close it. So that was Python uh, powered by Pyodide. Um, but now let's talk about another kind of kernels. Um, so Xeus is a Jupyter project, and it's a, a framework for uh, authoring um, Jupyter kernels. And it's written in C++. And there are a couple of kernels uh, using Xeus. Uh, Xeus Kling is actually C++ in a notebook. So if you haven't tried it, <laughs> it's uh, fun. So you can try uh, that. Uh, but that one doesn't work yet in light, but maybe soon. Um, and uh, there is a blog post about the work that uh, Torsten did to make uh, Xeus work in JupyterLite. So here I would like to, I wanted to demo one of them, uh, which is uh, Xeus SQLite. Uh, it was uh, made by uh, Mariana. Uh, and then uh, Torsten took it and pretty much made it work with WebAssembly. So that's, uh, that's great, because then we have this example notebook. So let me uh, maybe. Let's clear outputs first. Uh, so we can create databases, um, tables, insert data, uh, select the data, insert more data, select, select. And you see that it renders using the, uh, the Jupyter renders. Uh, so this is like HTML, which is uh, nicer to visualize. And with a uh, SQLite kernel, uh, it's also interesting because there is support for Vega, so you can even have these uh, static charts uh, in line in your notebook. So that's quite useful, because then you can uh, visualize your data and then download uh, PNG or SVG. So yeah. Uh, so there are a couple of kernels that are compatible with JupyterLite at the moment. Um, yeah, there is also JavaScript and P5, um, but those are a bit different, because you know, JavaScript is native in the browser, so it's a bit easier to get them to work. Uh, there is also Ren, uh, which is also a Xeus based kernel, and an echo kernel just for you know, testing. And there's also uh, Lua, uh, which is uh, also working in, uh, in JupyterLite. So in JupyterLite, you, uh, you can work with files. So here uh, we saw that we have uh, the, um, the file browser uh, on the right. And, um, and um, JupyterLite actually lets you kind of ship a set of um, notebooks and files by default uh, when you generate the website. And um, then you can uh, edit them uh, in, your, uh, in your browser. Uh, or you can create new ones. So you can create a new notebook here. And uh, you can save it. You can open or uh, close it. And then you can open it again. And it stays. If you reload the page, uh, it will be persisted to um, your storage. So it could be IndexedDB if it's available, or it will be uh, local storage otherwise. Um, it's still a bit clunky right now to access those files from Python. So uh, you can do it uh, via PyDide, and you can actually read from IndexedDB. But we are going to make that a bit easier, so it's a bit more seamless and a bit easy, uh, easier to, um, to do like real work with uh, files that are also on the server. Uh, but yeah, the, the files on the server are just static files, right? just like the, everything else uh, from the JupyterLite website. Um, one thing you can do with files is also share them. So uh, let's say you have uh, this readme, um, this JavaScript. Uh, you can right-click on that, uh, copy shareable link, and then you can send it to someone. And they uh, just paste the link in the browser. And it's going to open in a couple of seconds with the two, uh, two files uh, that you send them. Uh, that's quite useful uh, if you want to quickly share something around. Um, another thing that we've been working on for a couple of days uh, with uh, uh, Martin Renaud is this uh, new uh, JupyterLab extension. Um, 
So again, it's a Jupyter-Lab extension, but it works with uh, Jupyter Lite. Actually, the main motivation was to make it to work with this uh, so that we can uh, demo it today. Um, so here you have another file browser, uh, but it asks you to open a folder. So what happens here? So I'm going to show you um, yeah, a, fold, a repo called PyTutes. So it's like, you know, maybe you know it. Uh, it's like a set of uh, notebooks and explorations in Python. It's pretty nice. Uh, and let's say you want to use it in light. Um, this uh, extension is using an experimental uh, non-standard uh, browser API called the uh, File System Access API. Uh, it's only available in Chromium-based uh, browsers. So it's not working uh, in Firefox yet, or maybe it will never work, we, who knows. So uh, what happens here is that it asks for permission to open your, uh, your files. So remember here we are on uh, GitHub pages, but we access uh, content from my machine uh, using this API, and now we can uh, explore this. Uh, we can, uh, for example, open this uh, TSV file, which opens like, you know, almost like Excel. Uh, and we can also open other notebooks if we want. And you could, for example, pick up something that you have on your machine using uh, a JupyterLab website that uh, someone else uh, deployed for you. Uh, that could be one of the use cases for this. For, for this. Um, so, yeah. Um, what else do we have? Yeah, we have also real-time collaboration. Um, so this is, again, one thing that JupyterLite is just reusing uh, from all of the work done upstream in JupyterLab. Um, so if you're interested by this, you can check the, the talk by uh, Kevin Jens uh, at PyData Global 2021. He goes, you know, explains how it works and how it landed in uh, JupyterLab. And um, it also works in JupyterLite, uh, but since there is no server, the approach is a bit different. So JupyterLite is using uh, a peer-to-peer -peer, uh, uh, via WebRTC to sync the changes between peers. So yeah, that is also available. And I uh, wanted to just show you a quick look at you know, what it looks like under the hood. So there is no server. It's everything just static. Uh, but still, there is a server running somewhere. So it's running in a browser, <laughs> of course. Uh, and the interesting thing is that it's um, built almost the same way as uh, JupyterLab, uh, which is uh, great because then we use also um, a plugin system. So it means that you can uh, use different uh, plugins for the server part. Let's say you want to uh, upload your content somewhere else uh, on your private network in the company, then you could just swap that for something else uh, and use private APIs, for example. Uh, you could have many kernels uh, or none. You could also have this kind of um, customization is, is really just uh, available. Um, yeah. So this brings us to kind of <laughs> where we've seen this going uh, like the past uh, weeks. So uh, we went a little bit further. So we started to also try to think of how can we make that even simpler? So uh, there is now a new uh, REPL application that is also shipped by default in uh, Jupyter uh, Lite. So if you're interested, you can uh, check that um, blog post on the Jupyter blog. Uh, we talk about it a bit more uh, with more details. And uh, what it means is that you just you know copy paste this iframe code, and you put it in your website, and let's say here you have a Jekyll website, um, then you have your code console in your blog. Um, so just for the, the sake of it, I did this on my uh, own website, where I used to post some <laughs> stuff there. But uh, here, uh, you see that if you scroll down, um, you get the, the console. And you can also control the theme. So here, I put it in dark, uh, and you get the Python running on the on the Jekyll uh, website, which is, uh, which is nice. Um, but once we started to explore this, uh, other people started to say like they wanted the same <laughs> on their website. So we helped uh, NumPy uh, to also add this to uh, NumPy.org. So if you go to NumPy.org, uh, you scroll down a little bit, there is this uh, Try NumPy section. So you can go here. And uh, the idea is you, you know, we made it so that you can copy paste uh, from the left to the right, and you get you know, NumPy in your browser. Uh, and another example is um, try Jupyter, because um, Jupyter.org used to, well, it's still using a binder uh, to let you try Jupyter uh, in your browser without installing anything uh, locally. But uh, recently, there has been some issues with the funding, because 
Binder requires um, a lot of resources, uh, especially on, on Google Cloud or OVH, and, um, and these resources started to become a bit scarce. So uh, Jupyterlite here came uh, somewhat to the res rescue, if I, if I can say. So uh, here, um, here, if you click on uh, the JupyterLab icon, uh, it's going to launch a Jupyter Lite instead of a full-blown Jupyter. But we, uh, we thought that it would be good enough because uh, people who want to try Jupyter mostly want to try uh, the UI aspect of it. So here you have an introduction to uh, notebooks uh, on try.jupyter.org. And uh, yeah, it really helped reduce the load on the binder. Uh, and here we have a, a quick uh, tweet by Chris Holgraf, who uh, kind of said that this had a big impact. I think it kind of reduced by 30% or maybe more uh, the load, uh, which is great. Uh, so we pretty much just uh, traded compute resources uh, for just static assets. Uh, so that's, that was a big win. Uh, there is also now uh, Jupyterlite Sphinx, um, which is um, a Sphinx extension to also uh, let you uh, use Jupyterlite in your docs. So here we have an example with IPyLeaflet. So if IPyLeaflet is like IPyWidgets with, uh, with, with uh, interactive maps. So if I go here um, to the docs, you actually have a notebook. So we saw the REPL application, but you can also embed the notebook if you prefer. And here it's really nice because users are landing on your docs they are really just able to try it uh, from the start. So there's nothing to do, no install. Uh, yeah, no in yeah, nothing to install, so that's, uh, that's great. So there is more to come. Um, Pandas is uh, looking into adding that to their docs as well. Uh, Simpy, I think it's, um, let me check, yeah, it's still open, so it's almost there. Um, but they will be adding uh, this repo as well. Um, and then we can start thinking about uh, yeah, why not just uh, why, why not just Python? Uh, we could also have uh, this for SQL, for example. Uh, so if you are more into SQL, you can also use a SQL light kernel, for example, and embed that on your website uh, if you want. So of course, uh, JupyterLite has some limitations. Um, for now, it's a bit more suited for lighter workloads. I mean, things run in a browser uh, still, so you can do really you, you cannot do like intensive computations, at least not yet. Um, and you still need to install packages with micropip and piplite that come from Pyodide. Uh, this is going to be improved uh, very soon uh, because there is ongoing work to leverage the whole Conda Forge uh, infrastructure. Um, accessing files uh, from the Python kernel is also a little bit um, clunky for now, but this is going to be uh, hopefully addressed at some point. And uh, another aspect of it is that uh, you need to download quite a bit of uh, um, things if you want to, you know, like for the initial load. But the good, uh, good news is that uh, it is then cached by the browser. So uh, if you reload the page afterwards, uh, your browser should be able to cache most of it. So that's, uh, that's nice. And uh, to finish, um, uh, what is coming next is a better way to expose files. Like I mentioned, um, there is uh, improved package man management for WebAssembly and Forge. So there's been a lot of work going on in a, a repo called Python Wasm, and it was started by Ethan Smith. And now there are also uh, uh, CPython core developers, uh, Christian and Brett Cannon, uh, working on it. And there is a keynote tomorrow on that, so if you're interested. Um, and there is also uh, the future of Pyodide. Uh, so Pyodide was started by Michael Drotboom. And there is also Hood and Roman uh, working on it. And now Torsten uh, is working on making that even better. <laughs> so. There is a, a lot of things happening on uh, WebAssembly, and that JupyterLite will be able to, you know, use all of this out of uh, out of the box. And uh, we are working on um, making better code completion with maybe it should work in browser LSP at some point, and uh, via dashboards. Also, uh, we want them to work in a uh, in a browser, so you can publish uh, dashboards uh, without having to install anything on your machine. And uh, with this, I would like to thank you for coming, and also special thanks to all of the contributors to uh, uh, JupyterLite. Thank you.
thank you for the amazing talk. We have uh, a lot of questions on online, and I guess we have a lot of questions here as well. Uh, do you have any questions? Can I see how many people have questions? Okay, good. Then I will ask only the online ones. Um, are there any questions, uh, sorry, suggestions, work being done uh, on getting the initial size of payload lower? Jupiter Light may not work instantly when loading it with slow internet. Can you repeat it? Yes, sure. Are there any suggestions or work being done on getting the initial size of payload lower? Jupiter Light may not work instantly when loading it in sl with slow internet. Yeah, that's true. That's very true. But there is, um, like I mentioned uh, at the very end, um, I think a lot of work is going on now in actually CPython itself, which is awesome because this is you know where everything comes from, and they are uh, really making an really amazing progress there because uh, it also has the um, side effect of uh, reducing the binary size, and I think Pyodide also over the uh, different releases, they managed to reduce uh, the, um, the size uh, to download, like at least the initial one. Yeah. So there is, uh, it's you know, progressive, but it, we are getting there, so yeah. Thank you. Uh, what are the performance differences for libraries like NumPy that would normally make use of accelerations like BLAS? What about PyTorch, TF with GP, GPU? Uh, <laughs> I don't know if anyone tried it yet, but it's, uh, it's interesting because we were just talking about it with uh, Torsten just before, and um, with the uh, ongoing work, uh, trying to reuse the Conda Forge infrastructure, maybe, maybe uh, PyTorch would be able to also run uh, in, a, in a browser. So I think it's a big maybe for now, but I mean, there is uh, uh, hope there for sure. Thank you. Mm. Can dependencies be installed at runtime, or does every dependency need to be statically compiled? Uh, no, they can be installed by at runtime. So, um, so if we go back to uh, some examples, uh, you need to install them uh, on the fly uh, using um, this micro pip. And the pip light is a, it's kind of a wrapper around micro pip for Jupyter Light. So you can do this. Um, but you can also, if you want, at least for now, you can also rebuild Pyodide um, uh, and include packages if you want. Uh, but uh, again, like in the future, this should make it. This should be uh, much easier uh, once we have uh, all of the building blocks in place, especially to reuse uh, things from Conda. Yeah. Thank you. Can Jupyter Lite interact with Git? Can Jupyter Lite interact with Git? With Git, um, uh, we haven't tried, but I think it should. Um, so maybe it will have to use something a different approach. So. Uh, one thing that could be interesting is to take inspiration from another project called VS Code.dev. Uh, and they, uh, it's like a VS Code, but running in a browser. So it's kind of similar, but uh, not exactly. And there is also GitHub.dev. And uh, they have support for Git. So I would say uh, it should be possible also, but we, uh, we haven't uh, looked into it yet. Mm. Thank you. How do you ensure the iframe embedding option is safe? Um, yeah. <laughs> Well, I mean, in the end, in Jupyter, you execute code. That's the, the main feature. But uh, you can also, uh, depends, uh, I mean, it always depends, as usual. Uh, but you can use um, uh, sandboxing, also otherwise restrictions for iframes, uh, depending on what you want to, uh, to allow. Yeah. Thank you. Do packages on Conda Forge need to be modified in order to be installable by Jupyter Lite? Um, when we don't have it, you know, it's still very uh, early uh, stages. so. Uh, now the idea would be to to just um, uh, use the uh, set of recipes to produce the packages, but um, uh, ideally with uh, almost no modification at all. Yeah. But uh, I mean that's the the ongoing work. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, one last question on the uh, online questions because we don't have enough time. How are shareable files shared? How are shareable files shared? Shareable files. Um, so for now, there are just uh, links to, um, to the files. So the thing I showed uh, with this is that if you, if you go back here, uh, it just creates a link uh, like this. So I mean, I mean, they are not sent to other people. It's just uh, redirecting you to an existing uh, deployment, to an existing website. So uh, this is like the easiest way to share files. Uh, but you can also, if you want, uh, use the upload feature here and upload a file that would then be um, stored in the browser local storage. Um. Thank you. Questions on the audience here? Okay. 
Thank you for joining and thank you for the talk. Yeah, thank you.